Stanford University. So I um, am going to focus on solutions today, as Lynn said. Um, delighted to be here, by the way. Many thanks. Um, but I'm going to, uh, to kick off with a, a little bit about, about goals and reasons for those goals um, and save most of the time for uh, what I hope will be a robust q and I'm sure with this crowd it will be. Um, I just realized. There we go. Um, so um, the, the, the first thing I want to talk about is um, when we, when we set a goal, what, what does it mean why, and how do we get there? And so we built the Climate Works Foundation, and I will explain what that is and, and how it works as we go along, around, in effect, these two numbers. Um, can you reach a reasonable goal? I don't, have to, I don't think with this crowd I have to talk about these numbers much. Um, but if you, if you dig into what it would take to stabilize CO2 concentrations at 450 parts per million, which probabilistically suggests we'll have two degrees Celsius temperature rise, um, you realize it's an incredibly tough goal. Um, one of the first things we did is we mapped out where in the world we could get the carbon abatement reductions, and I'm going to present that as we go. Um, why, why two degrees C? Everyone has seen this famous chart from IPCC. It's the burning embers chart. Um, more and more nasty things happen the hotter and hotter you get. Today we're closing in on one degree C. We've locked in a lot of, there's a lot of momentum in the system, so there's a lot more climate change on the way. Um, this is just a quick, a quick sh uh, film of, of Arctic sea ice um, over the last 30 years. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's dropped by about a third, um, uh, by over a million square kilometers. This is the annual minimum right here. The last two years were not as low as 2007, but they continue this, this steady trend here. So we're in the middle of climate change now. Um, just a couple more slides on the, on the problem before I get into the Solution, one of the problems in the way the debate is held is that people talk about two degrees C, and in fact, I started out with that number. Uh, that's a, you know, the limit we hope to contain to, the, 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 of the mean, but it's the, mean, the mean doesn't matter that much. It's the extremes that really matter. And this is what's already going haywire. Uh, and what happens if you take a normal distribution curve um, and you look at the extremes, depending on how you want to define them, it's a small number under each of the tails. If you move that normal distribution curve even a small amount, a 5% increase um, increases about five-fold the, the extreme here. Um, and, and what does that mean when you in increase these extremes like crazy? In, in Delhi yesterday, it was 122 degrees. People dropping like flies. Um, that's what the extremes mean. I think two weeks ago, uh, Memphis, Tennessee was underwater. That's what the extremes mean. We are going to have to invent a new vocabulary for events because the idea of a 100-year storm, it's now a what, a seven-year storm, five-year storm, 12-year storm? We don't know. Um, the, the storm of the century, or, or I mean the 100-year flood. The, the storm of the century is going to be the storm of the decade. So the extreme becomes the norm is, is where we're going with this. Here's a real-world example of the same phenomenon. This is um, temperatures in England. They've measured them for 300 years so far, um, and this is with a temperature rise of 1.6 degrees C, and you can see the difference between the heat extremes um, before that 1.6 degree rise and afterwards. It's a 25-fold increase in that extreme. So, so this is underway right now. Um, one of the other things that happens when you, I'm gonna go back a slide, um, when you move the normal distribution is you lose this extreme. That's gone now uh, in the Rockies. And so what's happened in the Rockies is pine beetles. These uh, pine beetles get killed during extremely cold temperatures. Um, and there's no more extremely cold temperatures in the Rockies. So the pine beetles are flourishing. Uh, and from Canada to New Mexico, the pine trees are getting wiped out. And it's, it's, uh, it's millions of acres now. And you fly over it in a, little, in, a, in a little airplane and see. And it just goes like this forever. So. Um, Part of our challenge, and this is not my specialty, but is to change our vocabulary so that we talk about, about the extremes rather than that two degrees C. Having said that, I'm going to go right back to two degrees C, commit my own sin. Um, if we're to stabilize at 450 ppm, we have to um, limit the total emissions of CO2, obviously, into the atmosphere. And CO2 has a very long residence time. Um, and so every year you delay this limit. 
you decrease the possibility you can hit any reasonable target. In, a, in the next decade, we're going, to cross, we're going to cross a threshold or two, which will, I think, make it impossible to get to 450 ppm unless we are very successful. This is a, sort of a, a best case scenario where emissions peak about now. And the area under that curve um, is a 450 ppm concentration. If we're a decade late, um, you can see what happens is you have to decrease faster and you have to stabilize at a lower number. So we could get by with reducing absolute emissions by 1.3% a year if we had started, if we peaked in 2010. If we don't peak for another 10 years, which is optimistic, then our rate of decline is about 3.3% per year, which is, by the way, the fastest anybody's improved the energy intensity of their economy in history. If we peak another decade later than that, um, 2030, you have to decrease at 6% a year. And that's, that's, not, um, that's not feasible, right? That's an economic collapse to get there. Nobody knows how to rebuild society and rebuild all the energy embedded in society at that number. Look what else is important here. You have to go to zero, roughly, because you've used up the area under the curve. So if we blow the next decade, we blow it. We're going to shoot way past 450. Uh, the best we can do is 450. Um, and, and by the way, even with these, we have to be very smart about non-CO2 gases. But let, let me say one other thing. I don't have a good slide to show this. I would argue, um, depending on your curve, depending on the way the economics unfold, 550 or 650 stable is actually harder than 450. It sounds counterintuitive, but what happens is, if you get there by delaying your reaction, you still have to stabilize. You still have to go approximately to zero. But you're going from a higher height, which means you have more economic adjustment you have to make. And if you, if you really overshoot, you have to go negative. And we have absolutely no idea how to do that. So, so the next decade's crucial. Um, here's a 2040 peak. Obviously impossible, right? You turn off the economy, and you leave it off forever, unless, it's, unless you can have a, a really a magical energy system that's truly low carbon. So, so we have to get there in the next decade. And so now is, in some ways, the beginning of the talk about solutions. How do we do that? So we started um, Climate Works um, a couple of years ago, but it was, it's been built on 20 years of energy policy intervention with the, um, the Energy Foundation, the China Sustainable Energy Program, the European Climate Foundation, and, and some other work. Um, and we looked at these curves, and we looked at the 450 ppm target, and said, um, if you want to be on this, this blue one, which is kind of reasonable, uh, what do you have to do? What, is it, what does it mean to go from a business as usual curve like this to that curve? This is just the first 20 years of that. This is a, this is a 450 ppm pathway. And this is business as usual. And the difference is pretty extreme. We have to cut out by 2020, compared to business as usual, 17 billion tons of CO2 emissions per year, annual emissions. And we have to cut roughly in half by 2030. So is that possible? Is it feasible to get there? We started out by commissioning a detailed study, which amazingly to me had never been done, of where in the world all the carbon abatement opportunities are. How much carbon can you save by making cars in Europe much more efficient? How much CO2 emissions can you prevent by not chopping down uh, the, the, the forest in Brazil or destroying the peat moss in Indonesia? What about industrial energy efficiency in China? And so on. And we developed um, a tool that we call the Sudoku. And what this does is array the most important countries against the most important sectors. And in every box, shows how many tons of CO2 emissions could be uh, avoided. So if you look at China, industrial energy efficiency, 3.2 billion tons per year. That's a tenth of the total. If China goes to best practices on industrial energy efficiency, we're 10% we're 10 of the way there. This map gets you awfully close to 450 ppm. And there's several stories that are embedded in here. Uh, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is um, a small number of countries, uh, you, can solve the, you can solve this problem in 20 countries. You don't need 192 countries. Uh, there are six sectors that matter listed across the top here. Sometimes they say five, sometimes six. It depends on how you break some of these things down. Um, because the you know, power can be broken down into end use efficiency and supply side 
and so on. But it's not an infinite number of countries. It's not an infinite number of sectors. And there's more good news uh, about which there's very little literature, which is in almost every sector, there's a small number of policies that are extremely powerful at capturing that CO2 emissions. And there are many, many policies which are basically a waste of time and energy. And so if we have to flip the direction of the global economy in the next decade, we have to employ triage. We have to focus on the big countries. We have to focus on the big sectors. We have to choose the right policies. And we have to attack them with a kind of intensity that's pretty rare in social change. Um, and and that's, that's the mission statement of Climate Works in a nutshell, um, is, is to get there. I'm going to give a couple examples of, of how we're trying to do that, um, and then a, and a little bit of conversation about the structure, and then we can, we can open it up. Um, what I thought I'd do is, 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 is well, I'm going to show you uh, a one more layer of analysis and then mention a third layer of analysis and then do two case studies. So the next layer of analysis, I'm sure everybody's seen this. This is a, this is a global cost curve. How much is it going to cost to get on that lower curve, that blue curve? So you can see the total is about the same. There's 30 billion tons of CO2 emissions per year by 2030. That's kind of our, our target. And options beneath this, beneath zero on this line are options that pay for themselves. And options above zero on that line are options you have to pay for. Um, and they're organized by sector. Again, those same sectors, industry, buildings, forests, waste, and so on. And this is actually an integrated device. We've now paid for detailed cost curves in over 20 nations. Um, they cost about a million bucks each. Um, they're, they're unbelievably detailed. If you look at the industrial sector in China, which we're going to look at in a sec, um, it has um, tens of thousands of data points in there. They know about every cement company and every steel company, all the big ones, and so on in China. They know their current efficiency and where they can get to and what it'll cost to get there and what technologies are required. And those are all summed up into this splendid graph here. A couple of quick observations. The net cost is very low to get to 30. The area underneath zero is approximately equal to the area above zero. That doesn't tell you anything about the transaction costs or social costs or who wins or who loses. But society as a whole can achieve this carbon at a nominal cost or nominal benefit. If you look at the co-benefits, I think it's strongly positive in reduced you know, oil-driven res recessions and reduced wars over natural resources and reduced air pollution and reduced destruction of natural systems. Um, but even if you only look at energy costs, this is a pretty good deal if, you, if, you're, if you're smart about it. Um, uh, in, the, the, the other layer of analysis which, which we're working on is to say which policies capture this carbon abatement potential most effectively. Uh, because this is a technical potential. And if you look at any one of these things, if you look at um, transportation in the orange here, Sorry, there's two oranges. But I can't break it out here. Here's one, light duty vehicle fuel efficiency improvements. Um, of, this is one particular type of them. Um, you can actually capture that whole rectangle at that price with a fuel efficiency standard. That's easy to get. Industrial energy efficiency is harder to get because there isn't much good industrial energy efficiency policy. There's some good examples here and there. Um, but the industrial sector is so heterogeneous and has so many actors, you can't just get there with a single performance standard. So some policies work very well in capturing large chunks of this carbon emission, a lot on the x-axis, at a very low price. Uh, and others are, others are definitely tougher. Um, here's a blowout of one square of the Sudoku. That was the one I pointed out before. Oh, I call that grid of sectors and countries. I call it our Sudoku because it has to add up to 30 gigatons. Um, this is the one that's China industrial energy efficiency. 3.2 gigatons savings per year by 2030 is the potential that we've, that, that's, we've calculated with this. And this is where, uh, you know, dozens of Chinese analysts um, did surveys of thousands, over 1,000 Chinese industries um, to figure out where the energy efficiency potential is. China um, produces more than half the world's cement. They're the biggest industrial um, production numbers on, on almost every, maybe every single commodity um, that there is. They have a, um, uh, a mix of some of the worst and some of the best technologies uh, in almost every sector as well. They're in the middle of a massive consolidation and reform of the industrial sector. And this is very much to our advantage. In nations where there's slow product turnover, it's very hard to get any of this carbon or slow capital stock turnover. But China doesn't have that issue. Um, so you can see here that you can get more than half of that target through policies that pay for themselves. So this analysis has been discussed at length 
in incredible detail with Chinese decision makers. Um, and they, they, of course, do their own work. Um, and, and they've made a commitment on industrial energy efficiency, uh, which is really unlike any other. Um, and we've been working with them on this. Started out with the top 1,000 industries in China. The top 1,000 industries in China consume a third of that country's energy, produce a third of that country's CO2 emissions. Cement plants, uh, steel plants, and the like. Um, and so, and so the, the, the Chinese government said, how fast can we improve? How far can we improve these top 1,000 industries? And they set a, a target for every one of them. And a target in America is a, a, you know, a nice letter and a handshake. And a target in China is, do you want your job next year or not? Um, and, and this program has been a spectacular success so far. Um, they've actually, they're actually beating their targets on China's industrial energy efficiency in the top 1,000. They're going to expand this next year. They're going to go to the, next, to the top 10,000 industries. They have a long way to go. The Chinese economy uses 10 times as much energy to produce a dollar of goods as the Japanese economy. Um, that's not just efficiency. That's actually mostly structural. Um, but they have a long way to go. So, the, so China's government recently committed to a 40 to 45 percent reduction in CO2 emissions per dollar of goods by 2020. Um, if China meets that number and also meets incredibly ambitious renewable energy goals that are going to be in the next five-year plan, they're going to be on a road to peak around 2020 or 25. So it's definitely possible to get the world's largest CO2 emitter on the right track. That doesn't mean it's done. That doesn't mean the policies that are in place are enough. And that doesn't mean they're going to achieve the policies they have in place. But as a policy lesson, the China's experience is, is instructive. Here's what they've done. They've done this incredibly detailed inventory of carbon abatement <laughs> opportunities. They've put targets on for every mayor, for every governor, for every factory manager. Um, they have uh, made political promotion dependent on your meeting your targets. So it matters. Um, they're starting price reform on energy prices. They've done quite a bit of that already. Um, and they are um, really serious about capital stock turnover. And this is something that is, is uniquely Chinese as far as I know. Um, for example, when they decided to get rid of two-stroke engine, uh, you know, tuk -tuk, not tuk-tuk, um, mopeds and things, they just made them illegal, and two years later they were gone. Huge piles of them crushed. You know uh, China's been on this power plant um, construction binge, but what most people don't realize is that 60 gigawatts of the new power plant has been used to shut down old power plants. They've shut down 60 gigawatts of their oldest coal-fired power plants. So they're moving, they're, they're purposefully restructuring their industry, including shutting down old stuff to make it super modern. I'm not sanguine about hitting these goals. It's going to be incredibly tough, and they're going to miss some of them. Um, but this is an example of focused technical assistance, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours, but not millions of hours of detailed technical assistance in, in factories, uh, backed up by a political commitment of actually achieving one of those. I think we're going to come close to achieving one of those boxes. Let me turn to, the, to a US example. This is the cost curve for the transportation sector in the United States. This actually only covers vehicles and fuels. It doesn't cover systems. So if you have a um, very effective transit system in New York City and you make it more effective, that's not included on this curve. Um, what's interesting about this is this is definitely a lunch you get paid to eat. Um, almost everything pays for itself. Uh, this is also attainable with two policies, really strong fuel efficiency standards that ratchet every year for cars and for trucks, and a low carbon fuel standard, so you move steadily to, to lower carbon fuels. That's based on carbon content, not um, some definition of alternative or, renew or, or, or biomass. Those two policies capture almost a billion tons a year. Um, and uh, I don't know if you saw, I think it was last week in the, in the Rose Garden, um, Obama signed an executive order to take the second big step in this direction. The first one was exactly was it was just over a year ago. Um, this was built on top of oops, sorry, on top of work by California legislators and regulators. Um, that's Fran Pavley. Many people know about the Pavley bill, which was the um, fuel efficiency. Well, take it back, the greenhouse gas standard for California. Mary Nichols, who runs the Air Resources Board and our once and maybe future governor Jerry Brown, now Attorney General. Um, this, this work took 15 years, 
um, led by uh, a lot of environmental groups in California, Union of Concerned Scientists and NRDC, um, financed significantly by the Energy Foundation and some other foundations. Um, and they, 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 they did a soup to nuts strategy, and I'm going to just spend a couple minutes on, on what I mean by that because it, it's, I'm, it, it's, it's one of the elements of what I would call real world solutions. Normally, a social change model that people pursue is they have one thing they like to do and they do it. So they do analysis and they write a paper and they get it published and that's their world. Or they're activists and they get letters written and they go to meetings and they speak up and they write editorials and so on. In order to get the Pavley Law passed, which has now been adopted by the Obama administration for the entire nation and which will save two and a half million barrels of oil a day, um, mind you, that's more than the BP spill will, will emit if it runs all the way through August. Right? So, so these laws are significant. They're going to save that much oil a day. The work that had to go into that was science. What happens to California's ecosystems when the extreme becomes the norm? Well, we lose the snow. Um, and this was a detailed study done of, California, of what happens to the snow in the Sierras. And it was presented to Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was published in Science Magazine. You choose the Sierras because it's a relevant political jurisdiction. You focus your science on a decision maker who can do something about it. Um, and maybe that's maybe not the most important place to do science, but it was for this political decision. There was extensive um, economic analysis done, both at Stanford and, and at UC Berkeley, of could California t attain a very aggressive CO2 goal. Um, for the fuel efficiency standards, um, the Hewlett Foundation spent a million and a half dollars for an engineering model to show what it would cost for cars and what technologies they would use to attain these fuel efficiency standards. And that was presented in expert testimony to the California Resources Board. And it was actually prepared and specified by board staff. The, the specifications were prepared by board staff so that they had the ammunition they needed to do this work. There was um, an incredible grassroots movement. There was an incredible grass tops movement of, of, of scientists and policymakers getting together. A lot of polling went into this. Um, and it was not just, is greenhouse gas is a good idea to save the planet? It was detailed questions asked in depth in five languages in every assembly and Senate district in California. Um, and then presented personally by the pollsters to every member of the legislature. And then the results were spectacular. 82% of Californians wanted it. So there were full page ads in the Sacramento Bee um, for the whole week before the vote. Um, there, um, there were private gatherings of all the governor's cabinet with all the legislative leaders on the way up to this saying, we hate each other for lots of reasons, but on this one, we're going to get together and do this. The point is it cost millions of dollars. It took quite a few years, um, but it changed the law in California, and that changed the law in the United States, and that's what's going to save 2.5 million barrels of oil a day um, or over 500 million tons of CO2 emissions per year. It's a focused, intensive kind of philanthropy, soup to nuts campaign style philanthropy. That is, in fact, what we have to do for every single cell in the Sudoku here. Every one of these units here, if you look at building codes in India, point two. India's at the beginning of becoming the next China, right? This huge boom in India is projected. These are only 2030 numbers. They're going to grow thereafter. Or the power sector in Europe. How do you move the power sector in Europe to zero carbon? That entire cycle has to be done again. And it's got to be done by local experts with local political credibility and local credentials in the, in the appropriate language. It's not something you do by remote control. So, so what we're trying to do with ClimateWorks, and this will be my, my wrap, is build the institutions and build the force and use the disciplined methodology to go win as many of these as possible or come as close as we can to each of these as possible. Um, Climate Works got started with uh, contributions from two Bay Area foundations and one Minnesota foundation, the Hewlett, the Packard Foundations, the McKnight Foundations, made an extraordinary commitment. And now we've got another dozen foundations that are funding uh, either through us or alongside. And the topology is very simple. For every geographical region, build a very powerful regional climate foundation. This is basically a political campaign manager that's going to win the next Pavley bill to help go get that number. Um, or do the analysis to do the China, fuel, China industrial energy efficiency thing, work. These are, these are foundations with local staff, local boards, 
local credibility, deep political insight, and they're responsible for busting open the political gates and getting stuff done and making sure the implementation happens too. You don't stop the day the law gets signed. And then for every sector, building a team, for each sector of a, of a couple dozen of the best experts in the world who know everything there is to know about that subject. If you look at appliances, which is a subset of buildings, appliance efficiency standards are an incredibly uh, cost-effective way to save a lot of energy. And they, there are incredible economies of scale in appliance efficiency standards. It sounds as boring as hell. But refrigerators in this country use a quarter of the energy they used 15 or 20 years ago. And that's because the state of California put some standards into place and they got adopted by the rest of the country. So we have a team of two dozen experts who know everything there is to know about air conditioner standards. And they work in these countries on call for free for decision makers. So that when India sets its appliance efficiency standards, there are a handful of experts that go there, they've done it, they have the databases, they know how it affects industry, they know the cost, they know the benefits, they know how it affects power factors, they know all the objections that will be raised, they know um, what the European Union has done and what the Mexico has done and what the United States has done. So there's, they, can, they can, in effect, staff the government, give them access to accurate information in real time. So, so the other thing we're doing is we, we have built or are building teams of a couple dozen experts for every sector who are available on call to the decision makers in that country. Uh, and then trying to wrap it together and, and see how we go. This, this experiment has had its antecedents, antecedents um, with the Energy Foundation started 20 years ago, the China Sustainable Energy Program 10 years ago. Um, the rest of it's fairly new. Uh, Climate Works Foundation itself is only 20, sorry, is only two years old. Um, but we've got about 80% of this in operation and running. Um, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic we're going to hit the 450 ppm concentration or the, or the two degree target. Um, but I would argue there's no possible way to do it um, without that sector by sector intervention. And there's no way to do it without those specific policies. There's no, there's, there are no magic bullets here and there's no treaty in Copenhagen. Even if, even if Copenhagen had come out perfectly, um, every single one of these things still has to get done because all those targets have to express themselves in the economy. So that's the, that's the story. So, uh, so Hal has left us uh, lots of time for questions, which is great. And I'm going to take Chairman's prerogative and, uh, and ask the first one myself, but you'll be next. Uh, hang on, I've got, I've got a question first. So, so um, if you think about what happens, at least in this country, and I, I, your slide suggested this as well, there are kind of at least two really big areas where decision making in this country is, is totally decentralized. And that would be in things like buildings and, uh, and building codes, and then in the power sector where I would argue that national energy policy is determined by the local public utilities commission. So, um, so if that's the case, then then how do we how do we influence all of those pieces in a way to get to the kinds of numbers you're talking about? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> the federal government, partly because of federalism and partly because of its inability to move on, in any significant way on energy for 30 years, um, is is not that relevant to our energy future. It may become relevant. We hope it'll become relevant in a positive way. But even, even given that, let me take, let me take uh, the example you raised of um, electric utilities in America. More than half the carbon in America is delivered to customers through monopoly systems, which are either the natural gas pipelines or the wires. And they're regulated by public utilities commissions. So there are 50 public utilities commissions. They each have five members. That's 250 individuals in America control more than half the carbon in America. Right? They can set regulations as to whether the utilities invest in wind or efficiency or coal or anything else, and whether we grow or shrink in our demand based on those investments. Of those um, 50 states, there are probably only 30 that are relevant once you do the math. So you're now down to 150 individuals that control more than half the carbon in America. Um, you, you need to win these uh, PUC commission votes on a three to five vote. You don't need all 150 of those individuals. You can get by with 90 of them, right? So now we're, we have 
smaller number of people that, than the US Senate who control more carbon than the US Senate. So how do you get to those 90 human beings? Well, first thing is you have to speak their language and you have to know their forms incredibly well. So one nice thing about Public Utility Commission is they, they, they live under a set of rules that are understandable. They have hearings, you have to present evidence. They live in a statutory world where sometimes they have to do the smart things. Sometimes they're prohibited from doing the smart things, but it's there, it's obvious, you can read it. Um, the, the venues are incredibly boring um, and they're mastered by the utilities. The utilities' lifeblood is winning every one of those arguments. But you can actually match those guys. It's a little bit of a David versus Goliath battle, but in a dozen states so far, David's won. Um, and it's it, costs a, it costs anywhere from a million bucks to five million bucks to win one of those battles. In, 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 and you, but it has to be very focused. You have to choose your time well, you have to choose your politics well, and you have to do it, if you're in Ohio, you have to do it with Ohio groups and Ohio experts and Ohio data and Ohio politics. You can't, you, there's no drive-by um, social change. <laughs> so, so I would say you can do it, but you have to be pretty ruthless about both your math and your method. So. Hi, uh, two questions. Uh, uh, 450, uh, PPM, I thought 350 was the tipping point. And I just want to know, you know, where this number comes from. And secondly, um, where's the carbon go? I don't understand why in China, building and transportation, they have to cost a few less than U.S. Mm. Um, good questions. Um, 350 is too much. 450 is too much, even more so. 550 is getting terrible. So, so. I, I, there's no right answer to that question. Um, at thresholds that we don't understand, the systems go nonlinear. And they're going to go nonlinear in, in ways that surprise us and, and bother us a lot. I mean, we don't know what's going on with sea level rise. It's happening much faster than the worst projections under IPCC. So, and I mean, I'm, I have to be very careful here because Steve Schneider is looking at me and this makes me nervous. Under IPCC, under working group one, not working group Okay. So, so um, you know, 450 is, is the point that's like politically impossible to achieve and scientifically insufficient. So therefore, we settled on it. So uh, aren't, we, aren't we, in CO2 equivalent terms, aren't we roughly at 430 now? Um, uh, in which case, it seems like uh, 450 is going to be in the rearview mirror before, uh, before very much longer. Well, so, so one, of the, one of the magical things we get to do um, I hope, is take care of short-lived forcers, and that buys us some time. Um, and there are a lot of non-CO2 uh, forcing compounds, black carbon, methane, nitrous oxide, and so on. Um, and if you stop producing them, they stop being a problem very quickly. There is one, however, that we're, we are fixing that's been helping us, which is, of course, sulfur, uh, sulfur emissions, sulfur dioxide. Um, and so that's, that's, a net, you know, that's, a, that's a forcer, and, and that one will go away, too. So there's some masking. Going on, but if you take care of the um, other short-lived forcers, uh, and you do a decent job with carbon, and you're lucky, it, it's, it's possible. A couple of years ago, uh, Stanford hosted the first Energy Crossroads Forum, and at the evening event, uh, uh, what is his old name? Pak Pakala Sokolov, mm -hmm. Pakala uh, spoke about the famous uh, wedges, which mm -hmm. is our precursor of the, the Sudoku. Uh, and one of the audience members, I didn't catch who it was, asked, in my mind, what is the most difficult question, which Climate Works, I think, uh, has a stake in. It's a policy question about population growth. Mm -hmm. And somebody referred to it as, what about the population wedge? So my question is, what about the population box or column on the Sudoku? I, I know this is a tough one, but we're talking policy here, right? Yeah, yeah. No, you, 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 you're, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, and, and actually, when I was at Hewlett Foundation, the environment program and the population program together supported some research on how big is a population wedge and what does it take to get? And what is it? And so, so some criteria were set, which is no, no, coerci no coercive measures, right? Um, meeting unmet need for contraceptives. Um, educating girls in developing countries. Uh, access to basic health care and so on. There's, there, are, there are a number of programs you can do um, that um, are, are, promote human rights and are beneficial to 
women's lives that also drive down population growth and also thereby cut your ultimate CO2 emissions. Um, and this, this, this uh, work connecting them to, it's actually more complicated than I had anticipated, was done by a, a team at, um, it was NCAR, wasn't it? Um, uh, Brian O'Neill, you guys know him? Um, it's, 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 it's a beautiful piece of analysis and we actually need to get it out much more. I don't think many people have seen it. Um, but the bottom line is you can, you, well, there, there are a couple more steps to the story. Most of the countries with very high rates of population growth are, have populations that burn very little carbon. So there's a time lag between when these, you know, when, the, when a newborn kid becomes a big carbon emitter in a very poor country. It's, it's, you know, it's decades. So you don't have a big short-term impact on CO2 emissions. Um, even if, but in the long run, if you presume that by 2050 or so, we hope to have much more equal um, affluence, right, or prosperity, however you want to put it, um, it starts to make a big difference. So, so the bottom line is, um, on those cost curves, it's, an, it's a very cost-effective way of getting CO2 emissions. You don't get um, a large number in the early years, but it adds up quite a bit in the later years. I, sh I should have, I should put this in this, in, I, should, I should prepare that. We didn't, why didn't we tackle that? Um, really because we had our hands full, you know. I mean, if you look at trying to build all these campaigns in all these countries and do it effectively, we just couldn't do any more. And we knew there would be a lot of political heat that came with it. So, the, so in just practical terms, the benefit-cost ratio is terrible. On the other hand, I think it needs to be done. And I think it needs to be done in some ways along the lines that I suggested is you set very strict criteria about what you mean by population control. You probably you know, like everything else, have to phrase it in different terms. Um, but you may as well do the math, and you may as well get the programs going. And if there is to be mitigation money, God, it's a great way to spend money. So. Um, specifically dealing with deforestation in Latin America, I noticed that, mm -hmm. you, uh, that you had 2.7 gigatons of potential reduction yep. uh, up on the Sudoku chart. Um, as, you know, part of the big problem with deforestation in Brazil, you know, with the Amazon is that there is no viable economic alternative for, um, you know, for people other than logging, other than building, and um, the creation of sort of comparatively advantageous industries like uh, Brazil nuts where you maintain the forest but still have um, the economies. How, how is Climate Works working, to, working on that situation? That's it's a great question too. So, so the the forest calm, which I didn't really mention, um, in our in our little world is um, we we've helped build something called the Climate and Land Use Alliance to go after that, and it and it and it's made up of the um, Packard, Moore, Ford, and Climate Works Foundations, and they've together pooled about forty million bucks a year for that, um, with really um, two geographies and one idea. And the two geographies are Brazil and Indonesia, and the one idea is red, which everyone, people have probably heard of. The, the, the red idea gets right to your point, which is basically, um, uh, in order for people living off of deforestation to live off of something else, they need a different economic prospect, right? You can't just put fences around every tree or every acre in, in the world. Um, and in, in a lot of these countries, especially Indonesia, and God knows what happens when they start to, to take apart the Congo, um, the, the rule of law is not, is not very good, even if the central government likes what. So, so the idea of RED is, is that um, the rich nations buy carbon from the poor nations by providing economic alternatives to the people making uh, their living off of, def off of activities that lead to deforestation or land use change. It's not just deforestation. Um, how you get that done is very complicated. Um, I would say things are going actually incredibly well in Brazil, and Indonesia is getting very interested. Um, it's helpful that Norway has put two billion dollars on the table: one billion for Brazil and one billion just the other day for Indonesia. Um, billions of dollars isn't a lot compared to the total size of the Brazilian economy, but it turns out to be a lot of money against the incomes of those those populations. There's, there's a further complicated question, which is even if you can develop an alternative economic prospect and also do the monitoring and also structure the transaction and also develop a system of rangers to protect the forest, how do you guarantee it in the long run? Because delaying that for 10 years or 20 years is meaningless. You have to delay it forever. Um, I'm curious about the 
curious about the state of the uh, climate change science versus the 450 goal. In particular, uh, when you talked about the area under the curves looking yep. over the course of about a century, uh, there must be a lot of positive and negative feedback loops over the course of such a long period. And so what is the degree of uncertainty about 450 and, and, and how well understood are those feedback loops? Um, there, are, there are at least 10 people in this room who can answer that question much better than me. And I'm, so I'm, but I, w I would say 450 is a political number. That's not, it's not a stupid number from an ecological perspective, but it's not the right number. Um, and we don't really know what kind of feedbacks we're going to create at 450. We have some sense that we might be all right. Um, and we have a, a greater sense that things are going to be really awful at 800. Um, but I, I can't defend 450. Steve, do you want to? <laughs> there are a couple of uncertainties. One is the carbon cycle feedbacks, but they're going to depend upon how much the climate changes. Yeah. And how much climate change is going to depend upon something we don't know the answer at the moment to better than factor three, which is climate sensitivity. How much does it warm up for a given amount of heating? So therefore, if you're risk averse and you're worried about the fat right hand tail of the distribution, we're already in dangerous territory. If we get lucky, and we come out on the left-hand side of the distribution, well, we'll be all right at 450 with Trump. So, so what you're really talking about is a risk management on the planetary life support system. And that, that went with 190 governments, but as you showed us, 10 or 20 matter until the plural ones have the people and the wherewithal. I'll, I'll ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to return to the Sudoku boxes you were talking yep. about. I understand it correctly, let's say you have a two gigaton number in a box. That represents you know, a forecast about a baseline scenario. Correct. And a forecast about a policy intervention. And the difference between those in that sector is two billion. Exactly. So I have two quick related questions. It's two billion per year in 2030. Per year on average by 2030. Yes. So I, I want to understand how confident are you that that method is producing a robust strategic result? And then secondly, how what could be done by you or by others to let me add a third question for you, um, which is, um, how can we change that number in the box on purpose? So, so how confident am I in the robustness of that? Um, uh, we have the best data in the world by a long shot, and it's not good enough. Um, so it, it costs a lot of money. It took a lot of time to build that. I mean, it was kind of amazing to me that it didn't exist before. Like if you think you have a problem and you think you want to solve it, you kind of want to figure out where and how. But that's, that hadn't been done. Um, and the wedges are great because they, the wedges are a pedagogical tool, right? Everything's the same size. It all starts at the same moment. They all go at the same rate. It's not a real world tool. It's, it's, it's a teaching tool. So we tried to translate the wedges into reality, and it's much messier. The chart's not as pretty. Um, those are technical potential. They're not um, revealed social potential. And revealed social potential has lots of things, and it's going to depend on the political system you're in. And so um, a building code might be very effective in, in, in Sweden or Switzerland or Canada. It might be very ineffective in uh, Mexico or China or, 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 you know, it depends on the, the, a lot of things. And so that, that we can't capture that amount of carbon at that price without certain other things working pretty well. Um, In, in most of the squares, I think we can get a, a lot of it. But the last thing I want to say is what, what we also need to do, which isn't a discussion of this, but where we've spent a fair amount of time lately, is change those numbers so they're bigger by inventing new technologies. And one of the big problems in the energy field is the amount of money going into clean energy R&D is, is pitiful. We spend more money on potato chips in America than we do on clean energy R&D every year. Um, <laughs> And if you add in other salty snacks, we spend three times as much. <laughs> Good. Let's see in the back. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I can see the appeal of going to the biggest countries first. But um, I'm interested that then you use the example of California and you use the example of Ohio. Mm. And going to the really quick ones assumes that the difficulty of getting change is roughly equal across all countries, and therefore you should choose the biggest ones first. And it also assumes that, that if you do go for a smaller country,
Yep. And yep. Still get those that it's, it, it's a great question, and let me tell you what we actually do because I, I didn't I didn't get into that. Um, for every major initiative that we look at across the world, fuel efficiency standards in India, um, building codes in China, deforestation in Brazil, building code, you know, whatever in Europe, we do an expected value analysis. And so we look at the tons of carbon that you would get if you won times the political probability of winning. And we have a fairly formal method of assessing the political probability. And it's not highfalutin political science, it's down and dirty campaign assessment. And we say, if, you know, if, if, I, I mean, if I throw a million dollars a year for four years at the Arizona Corporation Commission, I'm going to win a battle. I'm, I'm not sure of that, but I'm pretty, you know, it's a pretty good probability. And I can figure out how many tons of carbon I get out of that. So we do this expected value analysis, and we stack them up, and we fund accordingly. Connected with that is path dependency. And we're not as formal on that. And that, I think, gets to the other half of your question. If we get good appliance standards in Europe, it so happens that most Asian countries adopt the European standards. So there's a path dependency there. Um, so, and I would say our, our work on path dependency is at this point informal. In, in the US with these public utilities commissions, you know, we don't start in Oklahoma um, or Kansas. Actually, we did a lot of work in Kansas and got a coal-fired power plant canceled there. Um, we, we try to go where, in friendly countries first, we try to go in bellwether uh, uh, states, bellwether states. We go to states where we can win. Um, but we've also discovered that um, to win in any region in America, you need, a, you need a nucleation point. Like, you can't win in the Midwest because they did something intelligent in California. And you certainly can't win in the South with that kind of logic. So <laughs> it's not as exact a science as I'm pretending it is, but we do go through the discipline and we try to use it. The answers get a lot better. <laughs> um, Daniel Burlow here. I, I just have a question regarding the, uh, the power sector. And uh, what potential do you think that, uh, that feed-in tariffs have as a policy mechanism that um, predefines the power purchase agreements to procure renewable energy and uh, in doing so prevent further development of greenhouse gas emitting generators? So great question. A feed-in tariff is a special price you pay for a particular form of renewable energy. So in Germany, if you put solar panels on your roof, they're going to give you 50 cents a kilowatt hour, even they're only paying 12 cents a kilowatt hour for the guy that's running a natural gas generator. Um, uh, and then where do they get that extra money? Well, it's actually nicely distributed amongst all the other users in the electric system. So there's a way to socialize the cost without raising a tax. So feed-in tariffs, um, feed tariffs have some very important advantages. They create market certainty so that if you're a, a developer, you know I can... I can if I can win, if, if I can get in for under 50 cents a kilowatt hour in Germany, I got a market. That's pretty nice. Um, they, they, um, you, the, the decision makers can set them at pretty high levels, so they basically over reward that, that gets you to do R&D. And maybe you'll do some forward pricing to get in under the price curve. They're not cheap if they're badly designed. So the, so the countries that have used them have been European countries. That's why much more solar cells are sold in Germany than anywhere else, even though there's no sunshine over there. Nobody told them. Um, so the problem with feed-in tariffs in, in Germany and Spain is that they grossly overpaid. So if I tell you 50 cents a kilowatt hour is the number, I'm guessing. And I might be creating a lot of profit for a small number of actors rather than doing the social good. The social good is, by the way, the social good for feed-in tariff for solar is not to buy that kilowatt hour of, of sun of sun-generated electricity, the social good is to make the next kilowatt hour cheaper and the next one cheaper. It's to drive the technology down the learning curve. So feed-in tariffs need reforms. The Indian feed-in tariff is really cool. Um, they, have, they reset the price every year with a vintage. Um, and the first year, they set it kind of generous. And the second year, it's going to be medium. And in future years, it's going to be set by a reverse auction. So people will bid for the subsidy. And whoever bids the lowest gets it. And then you really are just filling the area under the curve. You're not overpaying. Um, and in fact, you'll get forward pricing in that case as well. And so you'll, you'll do even better. Um, so I, I think feed-in tariffs are, are a terrific device to drive down learning curves of new technologies. And if they're structured well, they avoid wasting a lot of money. Is that? Right. You, well, thank you very much.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.